Um, I'm Jen Sachak. I'm currently the department chair of exercise and nutrition sciences here at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Um, and I am great, really happy to present one side of the energy balance equation today, focusing on nutrition and bringing everybody here today um, to talk more. This is the second uh, seminar in a series of three, as you know, uh, cross-disciplinary discussions surrounding sugar and sweetener consumption. And I think that it's really important for those of you that weren't here at the first seminar to really think about sugar um, and know that we still have a public health crisis around excess sugar consumption um, here in the United States and globally growing. I don't think we've solved that problem since the first seminar. Um, and we have uh, multiple viewpoints, um, multiple stakeholders um, in this game. And here um, at the School of Public Health, um, as you'll see um, in your pile of papers, we have extended expertise in sugar and sweetener consumption, um, mostly in the nutrition sciences and policy. But we clearly understand that there are multiple viewpoints, um, multiple players in this game that we need to celebrate and bring together and discuss in a, a very balanced way uh, the problems that we have at hand. And so therefore, the goal today is to really have you know, the facilitation and representation from multiple stakeholders to give a balanced viewpoint of their perspective, um, allow everyone to sort of weigh in with questions, uh, with anonymity, and also um, with rigor, I think, to push people a little bit, to challenge one another. Um, I don't think the first seminar became hugely controversial. Maybe today we'll have a little bit more controversy, which could be a lot of fun. Um, but really, again, a balanced approach to this, and hopefully we all come away with um, sort of next steps. And just a reminder to everyone, uh, this is the second in a three-part series. Uh, the first one really looked at the policies for reducing sugar intake on a population level and whether those policies could be viable. Today, we're going to focus more on why is reducing sugar intake so difficult. Um, so looking forward to that today. And please mark your calendars if you haven't already for April 26th. Um, where we're going to talk more about the sugar alternatives and novel ingredients and whether viable options for reducing sugar. So please try to attend that. Um, we look forward to that as well. So seminar two, uh, we're going to focus on two um, main questions. Um, the first is sugar addictive. Um, that will be a lot of fun. And the second, looking at product reformulations, uh, the current progress, concerns, and challenges. And with that, there's a seminar format that I want everybody to keep in mind, again, if you weren't here for the first one. We're going to basically have two speakers um, for each topic, um, giving a point-counterpoint format. And each speaker will have a, a, a rigorous 15 minutes um, that they'll be reminded of. Um, there will be a 10-minute break um, in between, at which time we're going to gather questions anonymously. And I'll get to that in a second. And then that will be followed by a panel of discussions where those questions will be presented and discussed. So the Q&A is only for the panel discussion. I can't reiterate that enough. Please don't raise your hand or interrupt or write when they're done. Ask a question. We're going to save that for the panel and the, the question gathering time. We're going to use something called Pigeonhole, which I'll show you a slide of later if you have not used it. It's a very cool platform. And we do have the, the Chatham House rule where we do want anonymity to encourage openness and um, level discussion. And for those of you always scared to ask questions, you can ask them um, with no problem. And you also have time to think about the questions you want to ask because there will be that break, which is also nice. You're not sort of put on the spot to raise your hand. Um, and again, we do want to pub pub publish these proceedings, so that will also be nice to have this balanced viewpoint and not really attributing questions to certain individuals or from certain organizations. And this is what pigeonhole looks like. Nobody needs to write this down now because this will actually be put up on the monitor at breaks. And you can basically log, enter the passcode sugar and then enter your questions and those will be gathered and then again put forward to the panel for discussion. And with that, um, I can't thank enough um, George Washington University for helping to sponsor this event. Um, it's great that we can do this in-house and have this and bring all these people together, um, both here in the room and nationally. And also all the administrative support that goes in behind the scenes, seeing everybody scurrying around trying to get this ready so that it goes off without any hiccups is pretty amazing and much greatly appreciated. And I have to definitely um, give a reach out to Dr. Allison Savisky, um, who is really 
been the one who spearheaded this whole endeavor, which hopefully you hear from at some point today. But she has really um, brought this here to everyone today for our pleasure, enjoyment, and um, hopefully some great thoughts um, will be presented today. Um, so with that, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Kim Robin, who is going to introduce our first two speakers. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jen. So um, I'm Kim Robin. I am a faculty member in the Department of Exercise and Nutrition Sciences here at George Washington University and uh, a nutritional scientist, registered dietitian, public health nutritionist, all of those things. Very excited for today's discussion. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. So um, our first speaker today is going to be Dr. Nicole Avina. Uh, Dr. Avina is a research psychologist and a uh, neuroscientist who is an expert in the fields of nutrition, diet, and addiction. She received her PhD in psychology and neuroscience from Princeton University in 2006, followed by a postdoc fellowship at Rockefeller University. Dr. Avina is currently an assistant professor in neuroscience at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York and a visiting professor in health psychology at Princeton. She has published over 90 scholarly journal articles on the topic of diet, nutrition, and overeating. So welcome, Dr. Avina. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm happy to be here. Um, so I have 15 minutes to tell you about my life's work, essentially. So I'm going to talk a little quickly. I'm going to leave, obviously, big parts of it out, but I'm hoping to kind of give you some bullet points in terms of what I think are some of the highlights related to this idea of whether or not sugar can be addictive. So here's an outline of what I'd like to talk about today. I want to start off by talking about how we define addiction according to medicine. I then want to talk about some of the criteria for addiction that we have seen excessive sugar intake meeting the, the definition of. And so I want to go through some of the data that we have on this related to um, criteria for addiction and how we've been able to look at them through the lens of foods as opposed to other things that are traditionally considered when we think about addictions like drugs and alcohol. I then want to spend a few minutes just talking about some of the arguments against the idea that sugars can be addictive and why, at least I believe, that they may be flawed or wrong in some way. And then I'd like to end by talking about some next steps and leaving with some talking points that hopefully we can follow through um, in the discussion portion of the presentation. So the first question is, well, why sugar? I want to point out that although we're talking about sugar addiction today, I don't believe that just because substances, I don't believe that sugar is the only thing that could be associated with addiction when it comes to food. I'm going to be talking about the research that relates to sugar, but what I believe is that it's highly processed foods that seem to be associated with addictive like eating. Um, there's data that suggests that excess amounts of fat intake are also associated with addictive eating. So I'm talking about sugar today, but by no means does that mean that sugar is the only potential ingredient that could be associated with these behaviors and these brain changes that I'm going to talk about today. So just like cocaine's addictive and alcohol's addictive, we have different substances that could potentially be associated with addictive like eating. So why focus on sugar? Well, one of the reasons why we started focusing on sugar in our research lab was because there had been some indications that there was a correlation between the rise in the obesity levels in this country and the amount of sugar that people were consuming. And by sugar, I'm talking about sucrose, I'm talking about other types of caloric and low calorie sweeteners as well, um, things like high fructose corn syrup, et cetera. So it's certainly not meant to be sugar in the sense of just sucrose. When we look at some of the data, we find that the average American, and this is data from 2010, was consuming about 22 teaspoons a day on average in terms of added sugar. So up until very recently, this was kind of meaningless in some sense because we really didn't have a guide to tell us, well, how much sugar is too much? Is 22 teaspoons okay or is this, you know, not an acceptable amount? Well, we now have some indications in terms of how much sugar is an appropriate amount. So we have the new dietary guidelines that have come out for 2015 to 2020, and they now give us an indication about how much we should be consuming in terms of added sugars. And so the uh, guidelines suggest that we should have no more than 10% of our daily calorie intake each day coming from added sugars. And so just to kind of do the math, because it's not always easy to figure out 10% of your daily calorie intake, that roughly boils down to no more than 12 teaspoons a day of added sugars. 
And again, added sugars are sugars that are added to your foods by you or by the food companies. Um, these are not the types of sugars that occur naturally. So we're not talking about an apple, for instance. We're talking about sugar that's added to cereals or sugar that's added to other food products that are out there. So let's put this into perspective. Now we have some guidelines about how much sugar is an acceptable amount in terms of dietary guidelines. So let's look at a few products to kind of get a sense of how this looks. So if we were going to take an example of a Starbucks Frappuccino, which you know people occasionally consume, right? This has 64 grams of sugar. So this would be 128% of your daily value. And again, not everyone consumes Starbucks Frappuccinos every day, although some people do. But it's an idea to give you a sense of how products in our environment potentially can contain a lot of sugar, and we might not always realize this. So let's look at something else. What about a Cinnabon? This has 59 grams of sugar. So if you have one Cinnabon, you're already over your daily suggested amount of added sugars for the day. So of course we know Frappuccinos and Cinnabons have sugar in them. We kind of know that when we're eating them, that they're sweet treats, not something we're supposed to eat as a healthy diet. We have them occasionally as something that's, you know, again, a sweet treat. But let's look at something that maybe people consume every day that would be considered more of a healthy food, if you will. So if we take a look at something like um, yogurt that has fruit on the bottom, many people consume yogurt as part of a healthy diet. Many children consume yogurt as part of a healthy diet. Well. These types of yogurts can have about half of the daily value of sugar in one serving. So again, you can see that many of the products that are out there contain a lot of sugar. Potentially, if we're adding up the amount of foods that we're consuming throughout the day, we're going to be well over the suggested amount, often before breakfast even is over. So now I want to talk about how do we define an addiction. And so this is something that's been relatively easy for us to do from the scientific standpoint. What we've done is to use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is a, a publication put out by the American Psychiatric Association that catalogs all the different types of mental illnesses that are out there and gives criteria that need to be met in order for one to meet a particular diagnosis and so that medical professionals can all be on the same page in terms of developing and treating people in terms of the diagnosis. And so when it comes to substance use disorders, and so these classically have been things like addiction to drugs and alcohol, but we're also now starting to see process addictions in the new iteration of the DSM, the latest version, gambling, which is a process addiction. It's not something we consume. It's actually you know, a process or something, a behavior we engage in, was considered in the addiction component of the DSM. But when we think about substance use disorder, we have criteria that are associated with a variety of different behaviors. So for instance, one meets, uh, has criteria that suggests there's impaired control. And so these are things like binging on the substance, having a desire to quit but not being able to, having a craving for the substance. There's also social impairment criteria. These are when you have a difficulty fulfilling role obligations at work or with your family or having interpersonal problems associated with use. I don't really want to focus too much on this, and we haven't so much in the research, because social impairment criteria are really dictated by our laws. And so if it wasn't illegal for us to you know, do heroin, then we probably would see more people using heroin at work. And we probably would hang out with people who were using it. Um, again, because of the laws and the sort of societal implications of the use of some of these things, this is where these social impairment criteria become important. There's also risky use criteria. So continuing to use a substance despite knowing it has physical or psychological problems. And then there's pharmacological criteria. So this is evidence of tolerance and withdrawal, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, I want to point out, you do not need to meet all these criteria in order to be considered an addict or having an addiction. For instance, um, inhalants or cocaine, for instance, don't produce a measurable sign of withdrawal. So you do need to meet these criteria. Some of these criteria, these are what are used, but you do certainly not need to meet all of them in order to have the diagnosis of an addiction applied. So like I said, I'm going to talk about some of the um, criteria A, C, and D as it relates to overeating sugars. I'm not going to focus so much on the social impairment criteria today. So in addition to these behaviors, we also look at um, what happens in the brain. So I, my degree is in neuroscience. I'm a neuroscientist, and so we study the brain. We know that drugs that are abused act upon brain systems that actually evolve to reinforce natural behaviors. And so we have to engage in things like eating and feeding and sexual behavior because we need to make sure that we want to continue to do those things because they're important for the survival of our species. 
Well, drugs of abuse act upon those brain systems as well. We don't have a drug system and a food system and a sex system. We have a reward and reinforcement system that all these pleasurable things activate in a variety of different ways. So the point is that there's overlaps in the brain circuitry associated with eating behavior and associated with drug use. And what I want to argue is that could it be that some of the foods that we see in our modern food environment that have excess amounts of sugar in them, could they in some ways be activating the brain in ways that are more like what we see with a drug and not like what we classically have seen with a food that is something that's grown naturally? So I want to take a few minutes to talk about the empirical evidence for sugar addiction. And again, this is really just a snapshot of the studies that have been done. So I'm really going to just highlight a few things. Many of these studies have come from my laboratory, but there's been lots of other laboratories throughout the country that have replicated this work and extended into clinical work as well. So one of the things that we see in terms of DSM criteria for addiction is signs of binging intolerance. When we have a rat model in which we have animals overeating sugar, so we give them limited daily access to a sugar solution, they also have their rat food and they also have water to drink, we find that the rats that have limited daily access will actually come to overeat the sugar. So they'll end up binging on the sugar when it becomes available each day. And you can see that here in the black columns, if you look at day one of access, by day 21 of access, the rats that have limited daily access are binging on it. They're consuming more of it in that first hour of access. We're not seeing that happen in response to their healthy rat food. So if you give limited daily access to rat food, the rats just learn they have to eat it in that limited window. They don't necessarily overeat it. So we're not seeing binging behavior. There's no difference in meal size on day one versus 21 in animals that are eating the healthy food. It's only when they're overeating the sugar that we're starting to see this rise in that first meal. We also see evidence of tolerance. And so tolerance is when you need to consume more and more of a substance to feel that same euphoric effect. We see that happening here. When we have rats that are given daily limited access to sucrose, we see that over the course of 21 days, they drink more and more and more each day. And presumably this is because they need to consume more in order to feel the euphoria that perhaps they used to get just from consuming a little bit of sugar. So as I mentioned, we're neuroscientists, so we like to look at the brain. One of the things that we see is that when a drug of abuse is consumed, it releases dopamine, or it affects dopamine levels, I should say, in areas of the brain that are associated with reward and reinforcement. That's a hallmark of drug use. Every time a cocaine, morphine, alcohol, you name it, drugs of abuse release dopamine in reward-related brain regions. Foods don't typically release dopamine in reward-related brain regions. You can see dopamine being released in response to a novel food or when an animal is hungry. Those are the conditions in which we typically see dopamine being released in response to food. But if an animal is just eating, dopamine release is attenuated. So the question is, what would happen if rats were overeating sugar? Would it look like what you see with a drug or like what we'd expect to see with a food? And so what we found was that, in fact, when rats are overeating sugar, binging on sugar, they release dopamine in a way that looks more like a drug of abuse and less like what you'd expect to see with a normal food. You can see here that they're showing a rise in their dopamine levels on day one, day two, and even out through day 21 of access. So there's something special about binging on the sugar, consuming excess amounts of it that seems to be associated with a release of dopamine that looks more like what you'd expect to see if the animal was using a drug. We don't see this happening when animals are binging or have limited daily access to just their healthy rat food. Again, you can see by day 21 that there's um, a decrease in dopamine levels. So we're not seeing a significant rise in the release of dopamine. We've also looked at withdrawal and craving. And so we see here that when we have animals that have been overeating sugar for about a month in this binge-like manner, they will show signs of anxiety, distress, depression, when we precipitate withdrawal with a drug that usually can precipitate withdrawal from morphine. So this is a drug called naloxone. It blocks opioid receptors in the brain. Or if we fast the animal. So if we simply take the sugar and their chow away and put them in a mild fast, we can see these signs of withdrawal occurring. There's also somatic indications, and other labs have reported changes in uh, blood pressure and skin condurance that are associated with a withdrawal-like state. We've also looked for signs of craving. And again, these are somewhat difficult to do, but um, I'll talk to you briefly about two experiments that have been done. This is actually from a colleague's lab, Mary Baggiano, who studies binge eating resistant and binge eating prone animals. And she can classify them as resistant or prone based on how uh, much they like Oreo cookies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what she's found is that the rats that are prone to binge eating, the BEP rats in the black, they're more willing to cross an electrified shock grid 
to get access to an M&M compared to the rats that are resistant or, or not too fond of binging on Oreos. And so I think you'll agree with me that it's not a good idea to cross an electrified shop grid for an M&M if you're a rat, but nonetheless, these animals are willing to engage in that behavior, suggesting that um, there is some evidence that they are um, craving the substance, if you will. And we also see that these animals who are binging on sugar after a period of absence, they will show an uh, increase in the amount of time that they're willing to work to get access to that solution. So there's a lot of clinical research that's gone on in this area as well. Um, I don't have time again to go through all the details, but I will point out one study in particular that I find to be very um, interesting and nice it dovetails with our research that's been done in, in laboratory rats. And that's showing that when you use a, a scale called the Yale Food Addiction Scale, which can measure how people feel about um, food with relation to addiction using those DSM criteria like I just described to you, and look at their brains, you see that there's uh, increased brain activity in reward-related brain regions of people that is correlated with their scores on the Yale Food Addiction Scale. So it seems that the more likely someone is to be identified as a food addict, the more likely they are to show neural activation in reward-related brain regions in response to a taste of a milkshake. So again, this is some clinical research that supports this idea as well. So this is a, from a review paper that a colleague published a few years back that took um, the DSM criteria and identified which ones had been met in terms of animal models or human data when we're talking about food as the addictive substance. And you can see here that pretty much all the criteria have been met either in animal models or in human models or in both. So I want to spend, I have I think two minutes left, so I want to just kind of go through some of the arguments that have come up because this is a controversial topic. I'm not going to stand up here and suggest otherwise. So I want to just kind of highlight a few of the things that have come up when we talk about sugar addiction and kind of give my viewpoint um, on the other side of it. So one thing that often comes up is, well, too much of anything is bad for you, right? You could die from too much water, or you could die if you have too much oxygen even. And I think that those are certainly valid points. However, typically in the rare cases where people have died from too much water or too much oxygen, it's by accident. It has nothing to do with their regulation. The problem I think we have when we talk about sugars and highly palatable or highly processed foods is that we lose our ability to regulate intake when the substance is an addictive substance. And so just like we wouldn't suggest that doing a little bit of heroin is okay, no, because you can't control how much heroin you're doing when it's an addictive substance. And so it's very easy to lose our ability to regulate our intake of sugar, especially when we look at all the different food products that are out there and how much sugar they contain. Another argument we often hear is, well, we need food to survive, so how could we be addicted to it? How can you be addicted to something that you need? And I will agree, we do need food to survive, but I will disagree that we need excess sugar to survive. We can certainly live just fine off of foods that are low in sugar. And I believe that it's the foods that contain excessive amounts of sugars that people tend to overeat. That's what we're seeing as associated with increased body weight and this particular problem, not the fact that people are overeating you know, too much salad and healthy things. Another issue that comes up is, well, maybe it's the act of eating. Maybe it should be called eating addiction, not sugar or food addiction, because maybe it's not the food. Well, then why don't people overeat broccoli? That's my answer to that. Because if it was the act of eating that was so rewarding, then it would be very easy to put someone on a diet. You could simply say, okay, if you like eating so much and that's the reinforcing thing, then go eat this healthy thing. And we all know that that doesn't work based on the billion dollar diet industry we have. And then um, two last points. So another issue that often comes up is well, rats aren't humans. So what we found with rats doesn't matter. And to that, I could give a whole lecture on why I think rodent models are of utmost importance, but I'll just simply say that although we don't look a lot like rats, we actually share 99% of our genome with rodents. They're excellent models of humans' brain systems and um, human biological systems. And while we don't fully model diseases that affect humans in rats, we're modeling the behaviors and the effects on the brain that occur in these animals. And they're of utmost importance because we can't measure dopamine release in humans. We don't know what happens to dopamine receptors in humans in the ways that we can with animals. So again, the reasons for using animals in research are important, and also we have validated a lot of the findings that have been done in animals with clinical studies now as well. And that's why there's a need for translational research that incorporates both of them. So uh, this is my last slide. So the final argument that I often hear when I talk about this is, well, sugar addiction doesn't carry with the severity and the impairment that we see with real addictions. And to that, I will say that the severity impairment doesn't typically have to be as extreme as we typically think it is. 
So many of us, when we hear about an addict, we imagine this person up here, right? And again, many people unfortunately do fall victim to addiction that renders them where they have problems with the law, lose their jobs, and so on and so forth. However, that is not the most common addict in our society. The most common addict in our society is this person who is a fully functioning individual, has little noticeable intoxication, the withdrawal syndrome isn't life-threatening, but because of smoking's health-related complications, it's the number one cause of preventable death in the United States. So if we're gonna talk about addiction, we have to remember this is an addict. This person's also an addict, but this is the typical addict that we see in our society. Okay, so just a summary of what I said and then some next steps. I believe that there's a growing body of empirical research in animal models and also in humans that supports the idea that overconsumption of sugar-rich foods can result in DSM criteria for substance use disorder, or what's otherwise known as addiction. I don't think it's the sugar per se, and we see that from our data. And if we had more time to go through the details, you would have seen that animals that occasionally get sugar or have less amounts of sugar don't show those addiction-like behavioral changes and changes in the brain. It's only the animals that are overeating the sugar, consuming excess amounts of it. So I don't think it's the sugar per se. I think it's the amount of sugar that's being consumed that seems to be producing these behaviors and brain changes. Um, and again, I don't think it's just added sugar. There's plenty of research out there that's actually pointing more toward the fact of over-processing or highly processed foods, which often do contain added sugars. But I don't necessarily think that it is sugar in and of itself that is producing these effects in terms of addiction-like changes. So I think moving forward, we need to better understand how much added sugar is in one's diet and educate the public more about that so people are aware of how much they're consuming so that they have an idea of what's an appropriate amount for good health. We now have the new dietary guidelines, which are a start toward educating people about that. And I do think that we really need to work together with food companies to help identify ways that we can reduce the intake of added sugars without taking away from the appealingness of the food and still making it something that's delicious and tasty and something that people want to buy. And that's all I have. Thank you. So our next speaker will be Dr. Courtney Gain. Uh, Dr. Gain is the president and CEO of the Sugar Association in Washington, D.C. Prior to this appointment in April 2016, Dr. Gain served as the vice president of scientific affairs for the Sugar Association. Uh, Dr. Gain previously was a senior science program manager at the North American branch of the International Life Sciences Institute, ILSI North America, which is a public nonprofit scientific foundation that advances the understanding and application of science related to nutrition quality and safety of the food supply. Prior to ILSI, Dr. Gain held uh, positions of project director in nutrition and wellness at the nonprofit organization Convergence and as a science manager at Food Minds, a public relations firm. She began her career in academia as an assistant professor at East Carolina University. Um, having obtained her PhD in nutritional sciences and biochemistry and a master's degree in dietetics from the University of Connecticut, um, this is the part I think is really fun. Dr. Gain was also a co-captain of the UConn women's basketball team. Yay. And uh, she's a native of Washingtonian. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Gain. Um, I guess I'll start out by saying my former teammate is the new GW women's basketball coach, Jen Rosati. So um, I'm, through her, a big GW fan now. Um, all right, let me figure out how to work things over here. Um, you know, just listening to Dr. Avina's presentation, and I don't envy, or you all, none of you should envy me for following her because she has uh, done a great work of research and is a great presenter, and I actually don't disagree with everything she said. So there might be some drama, but not as much, not as, much as you might think. Um, I just want to start out by explaining what the Sugar Association is. We've been around for 75 years. We represent the U.S. sugar beet and sugar cane growers, the processors and refiners. Um, our mission statement's below, but uh, you could consider us the scientific arm of the U.S. sugar industry. 
I'm going to start out, and, and I came to the sugar industry three and a half years ago, uh, and really my passion for doing so was, uh, you know, my background is in protein metabolism and muscle, right? It's not in sugar. Um, but I grew up in D.C., and I learned through my career the intersection of science and policy just through uh, absorbing, absorbing that and got passionate about it. I used to study exercise metabolism, and I'm still interested in that, but I really... Uh, I really saw what was going on with sugar and a really imbalanced dialogue with not, with not a lot of facts behind it. And I have a career passion of really communicating the dose is the poison. There's no one thing that's going to cure you. If you eat a blueberry, it's not going to cure cancer. And if you have a beer, it's not going to kill you either. And so sugar was getting beat up pretty badly, still is. I, I thought it was going to get better, but it seems to be getting worse, um, about bringing balance to the dialogue in a really objective way. And at the Sugar Association, we believe sugar is best enjoyed in moderation, and that is that is the truth. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And um, so my career right now is bringing some balance to the dialogue, and I hope that I can shed some light for you on some of the things that you may not hear, certainly in the pop culture. Um, I'm going to start out with that, just some basic facts that seem to get lost. One is what sugar is. Um, that one is, we done just finished some consumer research and a lot of people don't really know what sugar is. So sugar comes from sugar beet and sugar cane. And the, the pictures below, that's a sugar beet. If you're not from the Northern Midwest, you probably have never seen one of those. Um, and uh, you know the, the chemical name is sucrose, which we all know in this room, but consumers don't know what sucrose is. And, and so sucrose is commonly referred to as sugar. The reason we get the sugar in the food supply from beet and cane is because it has the highest concentration of sucrose, between 14 and 16 percent. However, sucrose is found in fruits, vegetables, even nuts. So the same sucrose that you eat in a banana is in your sugar bowl, exact same molecule. Obviously there's the conversation of what's coming with that sucrose molecule. Is it fiber, vitamins, minerals, um, or is it just a bunch of fat and more sugar? So that's certainly a valid discussion, but the actual molecule is the same and your body doesn't know where it's coming from. Why is sugar in food? We hear a lot about hidden sugars uh, out there in the pop literature. Uh, and, and to a lot of people, they are hidden. I think part of it is that we don't cook it from scratch at home anymore. But if you open up a cookbook, um, I've got a 1975 Joy of Cooking in my office. You know, you find sugar in almost every recipe. There's a reason that sugar is in food. Um, all sorts of foods, not sweet foods, in soups and salad dressings and breads and crackers. There is a role for sugar that's beyond sweetness, and certainly sweetness is the one that we know and the one that some of us love. Um, but some of the ones that aren't as obvious is uh, enhancing palatability. And that doesn't mean making food sweet, but it means balancing some off-setting flavors that people may not enjoy, like the bitterness of whole grains or the acidity of tomatoes. Um, you know, balancing sour and spicy flavors. So sugar is often added in small quantities just to balance flavor, to not make it sweet. It also enhances mouthfeel. Uh, certainly the flavored milk debate is a big one, but you can go from whole or 2% milk down to skim milk, and if you add um, some flavor with sugar, it gives the mouthfeel of a higher fat content milk. Depends on what decade and what nutrient is the demon. Is it fat or is it carbs? That's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so, so really, sugar is an effective tool for nutrient delivery. And two obvious examples, or, or the most powerful, would probably be cereals. Um, high fiber or whole grain cereals that are fortified and enriched um, are really unpalatable, especially to young people without a little bit of sweetener. Whether it's sugar or sucralose or aspartame, there needs to be sweetness to balance the bitter flavors. And, and cereals are certainly responsible for a lot of nutrient delivery. Same could be said for dairy products. Um, and with Dr. Avina mentioned yogurt, I fully agree that a lot of times there's oversweetening of the food supply. However, I cannot get on board with plain yogurt. So I think there's a combination of sweet and too sweet, and, and certainly we're seeing that go on massively throughout the food industry. Sugar is also a naturally occurring preservative in this era of clean label, which I don't think actually will ever go away, and I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, sugar helps absorb water and prevents bacterial growth and helps extend the shelf life of food. I think when it comes to the, the next panelist, and as we talk about sugar reduction and sugar reformulation, probably if you were to ask a food scientist, the most amazing thing about sugar is its functionality. And if you take sugar out of food, you're not just putting one ingredient in. It's often two, three, four ingredients, because beyond sweetness, there are all these functional roles of sugar in food that, that really can't be replaced by any sugar substitute. 
And I'm not going to leave out enjoyment. Um, we know sugar's role in treats and sweets, and um, certainly that's important, and, and a balanced diet is important, and all the customs and celebrations that go along with that. So how much sugar are we actually eating? And Dr. Avina showed one slide, but I'm going to show some, some trends. I'm going to start with calories. Uh, from 1970 until today, in the U.S., we eat a lot more calories, anywhere between 350 to 500 calories per day, um, depending on which estimates. These are USDA numbers. So during that period, over the last 35 or 40 years, as we all know, obesity has really skyrocketed from about 14.5% to about 38% today. The increase in calories isn't the whole story, as we know, but certainly there is almost a perfect correlation between calories and obesity. So what role has sugar played in this? And this little wheel chart, I guess you'd call it, is a little bit different, but I'll walk you through it. The inner circle are the sources of calories in 1970, and the outer circle are the sources of calories from 2014, and this was put out by USDA. And I'm going to start with the calories from added sugars and sweeteners. So in 1970, we consumed 333 calories per day from added sugars, and today we consume 366. So a 33-calorie increase, it's about 10%. I'm not saying that's not a lot of calories, just going over, it's about a 10% increase. When you move over to grains, we've gone from 409 to 525, which is about a 28% increase. And you move into added fats and oils, and we've gone from 337 to 562, which is a 66% increase in calories. The point of my showing this isn't that sugar has nothing to do with calories, because it does. 366 is still a good amount of calories. However, we're eating a lot more of everything. And you know, to focus an entire discussion on sugar, whether it's today or, or just in the dialogue in general, sugar is a contributor, but is not driving this increase in calories as well as obesity. And so a conversation that encompasses portion size in general, the increase in snacking, the convenience of foods, a more systematic approach away from sugar. Because if we just focus on sugar and we remove 366 calories, which we can't fully remove it, but we're, not, we're missing the bigger picture. So the, here we have another chart of the relationship between obesity over the last 15 years and caloric sweetener con consumption. And um, I know I started out talking about sugar, but when it comes to conversations such as this or of policy, um, even in that last slide, all added sugars are lumped together, um, whether you want to call them added sugars or caloric sweeteners, and this would be sugar, high fructose corn syrup, honey, agave, maple syrup, pancake syrup, you name it. They all get lumped together. So from 1999 till today, there has been a dramatic decline in added sugars consumption of about 15%. And during this time, we've also seen a steady increase in both child and adult obesity. Again, I'm not saying that sugar has nothing to do with obesity, but the lines aren't mirroring each other. So sugar is not driving it, it's contributing it to it. And the reason I'm talking like this is just because to make sure that the dialogue doesn't completely get off kilter, just in general as you walk about your daily lives. Sugar is a part of the problem, but it's not driving it. And I just wanted to show this slide just so we can all be reminded um, of all of the factors that do contribute to obesity, not just in in, as a society, but each individual has different factors impacting them. We're all different in how we're able to maintain, gain, or lose weight. And there are a lot of factors. And I don't think, I think this is great that we're having this dialogue today. I think it's, it's really important, especially in a scientific setting. It's much better than on the internet and a social media setting. Um, I think it's really great, but we should always remember it's a piece of the pie. And uh, as you all graduate and go about your work, um, there's a lot of factors that are constantly at play. Um, as Dr. Avina mentioned, the dietary guidelines have given us a number. Um, it's pretty exciting because we always talk about moderation, right? Drink alcohol moderately, consume meat moderately, eat sugar moderately, but what the heck does moderation mean? We actually have that quantified now. And so the dietary guidelines have given us a target of no more than 10% of your calories. So we actually have something to work with as we, we talk to people of the role of sugars in their diet and what that looks like. And you know, one of the rationales for, for doing this is that sugars contribute calories without essential nutrients. And that's an important concept. Um, and I think to get at what Dr. Avina is talking about, right, there's, 
you have your sugars in your foods that provide nutrients. And then we clearly know those foods that are in excess of the calories you need. And these are the ones that we need to talk about when you can't afford the extra calories and you're eating them and there's a bunch of things that aren't providing nutrients. And so this at least provides us now with a framework to talk about where does sugar play an appropriate role and for where does it play an excessive role. So now we have a moderation. Um, just another look at the trends in added sugars consumption from N. Haynes from the turn of the century on down. And I will say, you know, in full transparency, from 1970 till today, there was a huge increase in added sugars and decrease in the 80s and 90s. So, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s, we got up there. I mean, 18%. It's hard to say that's you know close to a quarter of your diet of added sugars. That's a lot. So um, there's been a pretty steady and dramatic decrease down to 13% today. A lot of this has been driven by caloric beverage consumption going up and now coming down due to reformulation and, and people drinking less. Um, and I think Daniel will speak on this a little bit after. Um, so we're not that far away from reaching this 10% goal, about 70 calories. Obviously, these are average on average on average. Um, some people need to reduce more, some people not at all. Um, so we're not that far away. All right, to the conversation today um, about food addiction, and particularly the conversation around sugar. So with food addiction, for a background, um, the theory or the hypothesis is that there are biochemical properties within foods that have the potential to cause addictive um, processes leading to a range of problematic behaviors that are similar to addiction. And this is based on two major assumptions. One is that there's a property of food that is analogous to the properties in addictive drugs. And the second part is that there are people that are susceptible to these, uh, these properties of foods that can be addicted to them. And certainly, this has been around for 50, 60 years, this dialogue. But in recent years, the research has really picked up and the conversation in the, the public, the pop culture, um, you see a lot about food addiction, a lot about sugar addiction. And I think it really got legs as we're desperately trying to figure out causes of obesity. Um, and you name it, there's something pointed in some direction. So what do we know currently um, is that we haven't identified a a component of food that possesses addictive properties. So there's no nutrient that's addictive. Um, we also don't have a clinical syndrome of addiction. So this really, in my opinion, is a scientific debate. Research like Dr. Avina presented is great and the work that she's doing, but this is a, should be a scientific debate that's still being figured out. Um, but as with a lot of things, it's moved into a public space before the science was settled. And I think that's where things get a little bit dangerous. Um, it's confusing because eating is intrinsically rewarding. Uh, we activate centers of the brain when we eat. We like it. It depends how hungry are you, how full are you. We're all so different. But there are some serious overlaps. Um, but with that, there's still not that evidence that there's a nutrient that is addictive. And that's where the idea, and Dr. Avina touched on it, of eating addiction, which may make a little bit more sense because we don't just have a bowl of sugar in front of us and people eat it. I'm sure there's the occasional person that can't stop at open sugar packets and empty in their mouth, but that's not reported in the literature. So sugar itself is not something people consume or not something that people can't help consume. It really is an issue of foods that taste really good to people. And that means something different for me as it does for Dr. Silvesky. We all have different preferences of what tastes really good. It could be a cheeseburger, it could be a brownie. And so it's more about foods that taste really good, nothing about sugar per se. And certainly food addiction overlaps with other disorders like binge eating disorder. Um, and binge eating is an addictive behavior. As a dietitian, counseling people with binge eating, very difficult, very complicated disorder. Um, and But it, even binge eating doesn't necessarily explain obesity. It's not that prevalent in the population. And even in obese people, binge eating is not uh, is not 100% uh, prevalent. We do know that excessive eating and recurrent overconsumption of energy-dense foods leads to obesity. I think that's something that everybody can agree upon. It's how do we get to that in, and how can we stop that that is an issue. Um, there are still a lot of questions that remain around sugar addiction. Um, you know, one current statement is that is here, and obviously if you can pick and choose the statements, but this is the one I chose, is that there is little evidence to support sugar addiction in humans. 
and findings from the animal literature suggest that addiction-like behaviors such as binging occur in the context of intermittent access to sugar. And these behaviors likely arise from intermittent access to sweet tasting or highly palatable foods, not the neurochemical effects of sugar, which is what I was just talking about. If it's foods that taste really good. It's not people in search of sugar per se. Um, as I mentioned, sugar is not commonly consumed by itself, um, so it is premature to draw strong conclusions about the validity of sugar addiction. Um, and a lot of the work has been done in animal studies, and I'm not going to throw animal studies under the bus totally, um, but, but humans are complicated, and why we choose foods, any, any meal occasion or any eating occasion is different for all of us all the time. And so to, uh, to try and directly extrapolate findings from animal studies to humans, especially for a topic this complicated, uh, can be dangerous. Uh, but there are, there is evidence in animal studies that sugar and fat foods do mimic addiction-like properties, whether it's binging or, or withdrawal in brain activity. So this does warrant real investigation and real conversation. Um, and maybe we will find things. Um, and I'll just reiterate that sweetness does not equal sugar also. So is it sugar, is it caloric sweeteners, or is it any type of sweetness that could produce this reward behavior? And so that's really important as we try and have scientifically accurate dialogue. Is it sugar, is it, is it caloric sweeteners, or is it just sweetness in general? Uh, I have this chart up here just to give a summary of the current body of evidence um, on sugar. Uh, I like it because it's super simple, because obviously this is a five-hour talk in itself, maybe more. But what do we know about uh, sugars out and health outcomes? So does sugar increase weight in an isocaloric exchange with other macronutrients? No, right? So calories ultimately win that war. Um, if you increase sugar, can you increase weight when you feed more calories? Probably. Um, you know, moderate, inconsistent evidence, but probably. You feed more, you're going to gain weight. Can you increase sugar and decrease weight if you feed fewer calories? Maybe. Weak, inconsistent evidence. Does sugar increase appetite, resulting in weight gain? No. Does sugar cause diabetes? No. And it brings me to this last bullet, which really is the important part of the dialogue. Does sugar provide unnecessary energy? A lot of the times, yes. Not always, not for everybody, but that really is the issue. Um, is it anything special about sugar, or is it the fact that some people consume too much of it when they don't, can't afford it? Um, or is it in the wrong place at the wrong time? So I, as I've sort of sprinkled throughout here, there are some concerns with the addiction frame, framework. Um, some of these Dr. Vina covered in her rebuttals to sugar addiction. So um, of course, I'm going to use some of them. Um, <laughs> uh, but one thing is, you know, it does trivialize serious addictions that exist, uh, just the term addiction. Uh, but it also could be dangerous to allow people, as this is infiltrated into the mainstream dialogue, are we giving people the self-fulfilling prophecy that it's not up to them and that willpower is out the window and that they're addicted? And there is some data to show if you're told that sugar or food addiction is real that you will eat more. So is, is there a danger to that? And is there also a danger to continue to vilify one food or one ingredient as being the problem? Over the past 50, 60 years, as I mentioned, whether it's fat, carbohydrates, sugar, we have one thing that's the problem. Well, what's happened? We eat more calories and we're fatter than ever. So people aren't learning how to eat and they're not learning moderation. And so are we going down a path again of just focusing on one thing? A lot of people are overweight, and I should have put this slide up. The most obese people from the Bernadette Marriott study, the most obese people actually consume the least amount of sugar. So those people that are most severely obese, if you're telling them to reduce sugar, nothing's going to really happen to them. So is this a false sense of hope that you remove sugar and then everything's going to be just fine. Um, and as I put the, uh, the factors of obesity, if we just focus on food addiction, are we missing all of the other major factors that are contributing to obesity? So moving forward, um, you know, remembering that each individual is different, there could be people that are eating bowls of sugar and can't stop. They might be out there. Um, you know, there's a chance that each person has their own relationship with food. Um, but these blanket statements and it is the likelihood that food addiction, if it exists, applies to 90% of the population? No. So we have to remember that these are theories, scientific theories, that are not blanket to every person. There are many strong arguments for reducing 
consumption of calories, energy dense calories, including sugar, and altering food and beverages and access accordingly. Um, it's hard to deny that. Um, but a real, the focus has continued to, or continuing focus on obesity should really place emphasis on individuals reducing caloric intake, improving the quality of dietary patterns, increasing caloric expenditure instead of targeting one thing. And we also know that restrictive eating patterns can result in overconsumption of forbidden foods and disordered eating. Again, this won't happen to everybody, but it can happen to people. And really, what I hope one day is that we realize, uh, we teach people young that all foods can fit and what moderation really is and what energy balance really is. Again, there are people that can't be taught this, um, but I think if we really were to try and teach it, we might actually make some headway. And with that, that's it. We'd like now to welcome Dr. Gain and Dr. Vina up for the panel discussion. Thank you. Great. So I really want to thank both of you for very interesting presentations. Um, and I wanted to start off by giving you both maybe a minute or two if you wanted to um, say something in response to the other presentation. We didn't really have an opportunity to do that. <laughs> Only a minute or two. <laughs> if there are any points that you want to make, I agree that it wasn't quite as controversial as I thought you might. <laughs> you want to go first? Because I did get to address yeah. yours a little bit. Yeah, so and I, I think I kind of anticipated some of the, the questions that might come up sort of on the opposite side of this argument in my talk, too. So I yes, feel like there was exactly. a fair amount of um, that. Um, but I, I think we are are in agreement on a lot of things. Um, and I think that, you know, I would agree that, you know, this is a very new area of research, even though it's old to me because I've been doing it for so long, it's, it's new. Um, and I think that the more we talk about these issues and the more we sort of think about the studies that need to be done, I think it's really just going to make for better science, better communication, and it's really going to be the answer that we need. Um, like I said, I think that you know, there's a lot more research that we can be doing and we should be doing and we are doing. Um, but I also think we're at the point where there's a significant amount of research that has been done that suggests that this is a conversation we should be having, hence we're having the conversation about whether or not sugar can be addictive. I will take just one second to ask a follow-up to that. Do you think that uh, the discussion is ahead of the science? I know Dr. Gaines brought yeah. that up. Do you feel that Certainly. way too? I mean, I think that, you know, we have very little control as scientists about the discussion that's out mm -hmm. there, and especially now in the type of like digital environment we live in where you know news travels real fast, often before the news even happens. Right. Um, and so I think that you know one of the, the ways in which I feel scientists can can sort of manage that to some extent is to be involved with the message that's being sent and to you know be talking about these issues in the media and talking about the science and the actual data. Um, and I, I think that's something that I and I know some of my colleagues have been you know more keen on doing lately because it is important to make sure that whatever information is being communicated is accurately communicated and it's not putting the cart before the horse. Horse. Um, I think that it's important, you know, for the public to be educated about the research, but I also think it's important for them to understand that, you know, there isn't going to be one study that's going to prove that something's addictive. I get that question from reporters a lot. Oh, what's the one study that we could talk about that suggests that some sugar is addictive? And I say there isn't one study because there isn't one cause of addiction. There's multiple facets associated with addiction. Same thing with obesity. As Dr. Gaines said, you know, there's many facets of obesity, multiple contributing factors. I do not think that food or sugar addiction is the only contributing factor, but I think it could be a player. But that doesn't mean we ignore all the other factors. We certainly have to address them. Um, so I think that you know, that's really the, one of the things we need to do moving forward is to think about you know, ways in which we can help the public stay educated, but also remind them of the science and you know, what that means so that people don't overinterpret it or make it out to be something that it isn't quite. Um, 
Yeah, well, uh, whether the conversations ahead of the science, actually just last night I got an email, which I often get notes, voicemails, emails, handwritten notes, um, <laughs> from a high school student uh, where this teacher, I've got to reach out to her, because a couple of them reached out to me. Um, they watched a documentary, a popular documentary, I won't name it, so I get a note from a high schooler that, you know, how dare I, sugar's eight times more addictive than cocaine, it's my fault, which is not uncommon in the world of working for sugar, but I, it really emphasizes that, you know, a document, this wasn't a new documentary, that when these, these conversations leak into popular, I don't even know what the term is, media, into infiltrate, and then you have kids believing that sugar is eight times as addictive as cocaine, I don't see a benefit in that. And, and to Dr. Avina's point, it's hard to control anything. Um, so I think the more proactive, I really can't say enough about how great of an idea this conversation is, um, having balanced perspectives uh, in, in an open dialogue in a friendly setting. No one's thrown anything at me yet. Um, but I, And one, the, the fact that I was invited. I don't always get invited to these conversations. So I really appreciate that. But I think the more that conversations like this exist uh, and the more that people pay attention to them on lots of topics, not just addiction, I think it's really, really valuable to help um, bring some facts into the dialogue. So um, as a registered dietitian myself, it's a long day. <laughs> Um, I also come to thinking about addictions in terms of eating disorders and more broadly about all of the different food components that people sometimes get focused on. And that's why I'm fascinated to speak with a neuroscientist who really thinks about these things on a different perspective. Um, I'm going to take uh, the moderator's prerogative and ask a couple of questions. <laughs> um, how, and maybe there isn't data on this right now, but how does sugar compare to other aspects of the diet in terms of addictive qualities? Um, I, we're here to talk about sugar today, so I know that that was the focus of your presentation. Right. But, um, you know, what about fat? What yeah. about salt in the diet and right. people's cravings versus addictions? Yeah, and it's a great question. So, again, I, you know, purposely focused what I was talking about on the research on sugar. And I, I tried to mention um, that that certainly doesn't mean that sugar is the only thing that could potentially be associated with addictive like eating. We've actually published a paper. Uh, fairly recently that looked at, uh, it was a clinical study that looked at food addiction, and what we found was that um, the, actually the level of processing was the factor that was most highly associated with whether or not a food was identified as being addictive. And so I think that that kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, yes, highly processed foods tend to also typically have lots of sugar in them, but not all of them do. And so I think that there are other features and factors associated with you know, the components of food that we consume that could have addictive-like tendencies or addictive-like characteristics. Now, I think, you know, a lot of the focus has been on sugar, and I, I'll just speak from my own personal experience, having, you know, started doing this research about 15 years ago. We purposely started off with looking at sugar because it had been something that was sort of out there as an ingredient that seemed to be linked to or correlated with obesity, and there was a lot of talk about it. There was also a lot of anecdotal reports of people talking particularly about having problems cutting back on foods that were high in added sugars. And so it seemed like a logical first place to start. Also, we were trying to be careful scientists and isolate our variables. And well, you know, my gut instinct was to say, hey, let's give these rats like a smorgasbord of food. You know, we wouldn't really know anything about the particular ingredients in the foods that were associated with, you know, the behaviors we were looking at and the brain changes. So we started off looking at sugar, but we've published papers that have gone on beyond sugar, now looking at sugar-fat combinations, fat in isolation, different combinations of ingredients that are more like what people tend to eat. People certainly consume sugar alone when they consume sugar-sweetened beverages that are, you know, can have sugar as the primary sweetener. Um, but, you know, we also consume sugar in combination with many other palatable ingredients that could also potentially be associated with addiction. So the sort of long answer was that, but the short answer is we need to do more work to understand all these different ingredients and how they affect the brain and how they affect these addiction-like responses. But as of right now, I feel that it's the level of processing, the foods that are very highly processed that seem to be the ones that are more highly associated with addictive like eating. And I think that's really fascinating. I'm interested to get Dr. Gaines's perspective on this, but um, as a dietitian, when I think processed, I kind of think more salt um, and fat. Um, and But, you know, maybe that's 
um, again, communication and the way that people talk about it and then redirect. Yeah, and two, you know, <laughs> we process food the minute we pull it out of the ground. And so mm -hmm. just saying, you know, again, these terms, we were talking about this earlier, like these, these terms that we use, you know, we kind of throw them around, but we have to very carefully define them. And so I've been trying to be very careful about defining addiction. I also try to be very careful about defining what a food is. Um, and also, when we talk about something being processed, I mean, we process food all the time. We can mm -hmm. food, we pickle food. It's a part of our, you know, eating process. And so how we define whether or not a food is highly processed is also another question that comes at when we start to talk about this, too. And that's definitely something those of my students in my food systems class know that we talk about various different levels mm -hmm. of processing, um, all the way, as you said, from simply washing foods up to a Cheeto, which is you know, a very highly processed food, and more salt. Even, but and, and certainly when you cook at home, you're processing it, you know, so you don't just eat broccoli raw. Some people do, but you're, even if you are, you're probably dipping it in some sort of dip, or you're cooking it in oil with salt, and probably not to the extent of uh, if you were to buy it flavored. But so there's all these little variables, which just for responsible dialogues, you know, these terms have to be defined, and, and there's always a gradient, so... I'm just um, taking a look here at some of the pigeonhole questions that are coming in, and I just want to follow up on one particularly around processed foods. And one of the questions is, how would you define highly processed foods? I don't know if either of you want to say. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't. I, I don't know of a good definition. Um, if you're just, if you're stumped, I will say that um, in the field, at least of nutritional epidemiology, there's a researcher in Brazil, Carlos Monteiro, who has been uh, working on trying to develop a classification scheme for um, the different levels of processing to allow us to start to try and study that in some of our human uh, studies around, ob you know, observational studies studies of nutrition epidemiology, but we struggle with that all over, and how do we talk about that? One of the things um, I was thinking as both of you were presenting is um, we have a tendency in this, um, in our society to talk in media sound bites and really summarize everything into the lowest common denominators, and this is an area where that doesn't do justice to, um, to what we need to be talking about. Um, let me see here for, uh, I need to pull this around so I'm looking at both of you while looking at this. Um, a couple of comments saying, so the rhetoric of the 70s, sugar is safe, is over. Do we agree with that or disagree with that? Some of these are kind of broad uh, questions about sugar in general. I'm not familiar with the rhetoric in the 70s, <laughs> but, but um, you know, as... I think I started out, the dose is the poison. Right now we have a 10% recommendation. It doesn't mean that over 10% isn't safe, but if we're looking for a balanced, nutritious diet, 10% seems to be okay. Um, you know, when the Institute of Medicine or the National Academies, now the Health Medicine Division, all the acronyms, when they looked at this issue in, in 2002, you know, what they found with added sugars is that you could actually go up to 25% before nutrient quality was diminished. I'm not recommending you go up to 25%, but a, a adverse health effect, especially, and it goes into the bigger picture that I mentioned in the overfeeding, right? So if you need 2,000 calories a day and you have 2,000 calories and 15% of that is sugar and you're meeting your calorie needs, you're probably, probably not and most people are going to see an effect. But if you're overfeeding and eating excess sugar, which is not uncommon, you might see some, some things. So I don't think this is a safety issue as much as um, especially around, you know, we're at 13% of intake. It's not, we're not talking safe or not safe. We're talking about energy balance and nutrient needs. Yeah, I think, you know, the issue that comes up with that, and I agree that, you know, the dose is, is important. And we see that in the research studies as well, because when we look at, you know, moderate amounts of consumption of sugar, we're not seeing those changes in the brain. We're not seeing those types of behaviors emerging. But I think from a public health standpoint, the issue is, you know, as I tried to illustrate in the examples I gave, many of the foods that people commonly consume are above the dose. And so it's it's very difficult, I think, for many people to you know keep track of how much added sugar they're actually consuming in a way that is gonna be realistic. I mean, if by the time you know you hit nine o'clock in the morning, you're already at 150% of your daily value, it's gonna be tough to you know stick to that 10% of your calories coming from added sugar. So 
again, that's where I think education comes into place and, and maybe, you know, working with some of these food companies to try to figure out ways in which we can reduce the amount of, you know, grams of sugar in certain products without necessarily detracting from the taste. I had, uh, and maybe you've addressed this to a certain extent, I had another question for you. I'm very curious about the um, addiction science and the psychology behind it. Um, do you have to be aware of the addiction for it to be an addiction? That's it, a, a great question. So from an addiction standpoint, I think and anyone who in the room who's maybe known an addict, I think the point at which someone becomes aware is the point at which they seek out help. Um, and so I think there's certainly a period of time in one's life where, you know, they are struggling with an addiction where they might not recognize it as an addiction. I guess maybe I didn't ask it quite right. I mean, if we think about people who are addicted to alcohol, people who are addicted to smoking and tobacco, they know what they're going after. They're going after a drink. They're going after a cigarette. Um, if, if sugar addiction is a real thing on its own, um, people may not know that, as you said, because there is a lot more sugar than the public is cognizant about. They're thinking they just want food. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that something that kind of differentiates a sugar addiction from just a general food addiction? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and it's, it's sort of hard to answer yeah. because there's so many layers to it. Um, right. I, again, I, I think, you know, we're talking about sugar addiction today because that's the purpose of this right. seminar. Um, but I think that, you know, the discussion really is about, you know, what types of foods people are drawn to overeating and what are the ingredients in those foods. Often it's the case that, yes, you know, people know there's sugar in cookies. And if they're overeating cookies, it's pretty clear it's because they like the sugar. But they also could like the fat or the savoriness of the cookie or the crunch of the cookie. So there's other features associated with the foods that could potentially be associated mm -hmm. with these addictive like, you know, tendencies as well. Um, but I think that it really comes down to, you know, trying to identify, you know, what foods are particularly problematic for people and then, you know, sort of taking the step back from there and then trying to look at, well, what are the ingredients, you know, where does sugar fit into this if it does? And, you know, how might we modify these types of foods in some ways so that, again, people can still enjoy them, but they can just be healthier. I also think there's foods, though, that people just don't realize contain as much added sugars as they mm -hmm. do. Um, you know, like I think Courtney had mentioned many, you know, salad dressings, barbecue sauces, things like that. Sugar's in there for a particular reason. Um, but when we add up our grams of sugar each day, we don't necessarily count the sugar that was in the poppy seed salad dressing we had at lunch. Right. Mm -hmm. So You think you're eating a salad, and so you're eating something good for you. Right. Good. All right. Um, I'm... Uh, I think we've addressed several of the questions that are coming in on pigeonhole. Um, there's one question. Can Dr. Avina clarify that foods don't cause dopamine response? Does that include foods containing sugars? Yeah, so I had to talk through that rather quickly. I usually spend a lot more time explaining that. So um, food can release dopamine in the brain. Um, typically, when we see dopamine being released in response to food, it's because someone's hungry, right? So if you're in a caloric deficit and you get food, it's going to be very reinforcing because it's making you feel good and you're having that caloric need restored. And so that can release dopamine and reward-related brain regions. Also, when we consume a novel food, dopamine tends to be released in reward-related brain regions. But the reason for that is not so much because it's rewarding, but Remember, dopamine does a lot of things. We're talking about it within the context of reward and addiction, but it also has a lot to do with orienting and learning. And so when we release dopamine in response to a tasting a new food, it's actually for survival value. Because if you think about it, you know, the very first time you eat a new food, you want to be paying attention because if that food makes you sick, you could die, right? So mm -hmm. we pay attention to the novelty of the foods that we eat because that's just the way we evolved because if you ate a bad berry lying on the you know patch in the forest, you could get food poisoning and die from it. And so normally though, once a food is coated as safe, our dopamine response attenuates. And so when we are, you know, eating like salad, let's say, or something, you know, that people maybe regularly would eat, greens, you're not releasing dopamine every single time you eat them, but the first couple times you tasted broccoli, yeah, you probably released dopamine in response to it. So normally the dopamine response habituates with food, but what we see when animals are overeating sugar 
is that that dopamine rele release happens every time that they eat. And so it's a spike of dopamine that seems to be released every single time the animal eats, which is more like what you would see with a drug of abuse and less like what you'd expect to see with a food that an animal is used to eating. Great, thanks. I appreciate that extra um, explanation. One last question for both of you. Uh, and this is rising to the top of pigeonhole. So um, is uh, the, and I'm gonna paraphrase, apologies to those of you uh, voting on pigeonhole. Is the obesity debate really a distraction from the larger health epidemic? We know that um, sugar uh, can, can cause obesity, but also cancers, other diseases. Um, should we be thinking more broadly, not just about the obesity question? but some of the um, other public health issues. I'm gonna try and remain not defensive. Um, we don't know sugar causes obesity, but we do know even the World Health Organization says that you know sugar's role in cancer is mediated through obesity. So I think obesity is an appropriate focus for all of these other, um, whether they're metabolic or other diseases that are offset. So I, I don't think that obesity is detracting from the overall health message. Yeah, and as a uh, cancer researcher, I do want to second that there isn't a direct link, as far as we know, between yeah. cancer and sugar intake. It is through overweight. Um, anything else to add? Yeah, I would say I agree. I think you know the obesity argument is appropriate framework to look at this, especially when we think about the fact that being overweight or obese is the second leading preventable cause of death in the United States. And so I think it's it warrants. The, the larger discussion that we're having. Good. All right. Well, thank you both for a little extra time to ask a few more in-depth questions. In our next uh, session, we are going to move on now and talk a bit about product reformulation efforts, progress, challenges, and concerns. So our first speaker in the second portion of the presentation is going to be Dr. Danielle Greenberg. Uh, Dr. Greenberg is a senior uh, director for global um, Research and Development, I have a little typo here, <laughs> um, a senior fellow um, in Nutrition Sciences at PepsiCo Incorporated. And Dr. Greenberg received her PhD and her master's in philosophy in biological psychology from the City University of New York and her bachelor's of science in biology from Columbia. She began her career in academia and she's been an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Cornell Medical College. Um, her areas of research include uh, physiologic mechanisms underlying obesity and the control of food intake. And she's specifically focused on satiety and the satiating effect of dietary fats, the brain gut peptides and the neural processes processes mediating food intake. Dr. Greenberg's career at uh, PepsiCo has included roles in scientific and regulatory affairs as well as public affairs. She's currently part of the Nutrition Sciences Group, and at PepsiCo she's uh, responsible for overseeing their research operations. This includes overseeing clinical trials, uh, to uh, assure best practices and excellence in research design. And she also has a role in providing scientific expertise on issues concerning nutrition and health, um, especially with a focus on nutritive and non-nutritive sweeteners. She is a fellow of the American College of Nutrition and a fellow of the Obesity Society. She also serves as a board member of the International Food Information Council and a past board member of the Society for the Study of Ingestive Behaviors. She has received numerous honors, including Future Leaders Award from ILSI International and uh, the Ruth Pike Award for Excellence in Nutrition Research from Penn State University. So welcome. won't go backwards first. I'm actually going to stand a little to the side so you might have a chance of seeing me since I'm somewhat vertically challenged. 
Uh, I should mention that this uh, talk represents uh, my uh, opinions and the views expressed here are my own and not those of representing the policy or positions of PepsiCo. The legal people want me to say that. <laughs> okay, so uh, some of this, uh, Courtney sort of already covered, but um, I want to discuss what we're talking about, and that is sugars. And it's not just sucrose, um, it's anything that's sweet, that's nutritive, uh, such as monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, galactose, um, disaccharides, polysaccharides to some extent. But the main thing is that in the food industry, we're not talking about if you just see sugar on the label, that's sucrose. But there are lots of other things that can be on the label that are also sugars. So agave syrup, brown rice syrup, malt syrup, things that sound relatively healthy like the brown rice syrup, it's still sugar. So Courtney did cover a lot of this, which is what we think of what does sugar do? It is definitely more than just sweet. It, is, it adds sweetness, but it alters mouthfeel. It adds bulk. So when you have a packet of uh, sweet and low or uh, equal or something, those have two calories. And the reason they have two calories is that each of those packets contains dextrose. Why? Because otherwise you'd have a little micro um, flake and you wouldn't be able to uh, see it. So the bulking aspect of sugar is very important. It's soluble, it has a crystalline structure, it's fermentable in high doses, it prevents microbial growth. Uh, it's part of the uh, Maillard reaction, which is things that make caramel. It leads to freezing point depression, very important for ice cream, modifies color, and enhances moisture retention. And this chart, I think, really gives you an idea of what the sugar is in determines its functionality. So. Um, Specifically for fermentation, you don't see much of that, but there are fermented beverages and certainly in dairy products. And in bakery products, um, if you think about making bread, I don't know how many of you bake bread, but if you do, you proof the yeast, you add some sugar, and if you don't add that, you have, and this time of year, in my religion, you got matzah. <laughs> so uh, sugar has definite functionality beyond its sweetness. All right, so there are definitely industry efforts on reducing sugar. And why? Well, the main reason is that consumers want less sugar. Uh, a recent study by Euromonitor found that almost half of consumers are looking for products with less sugar. And if consumers want less sugar, industry is going to give them less sugar. So. Um, this is publicly available information. I just got it off the web, uh, including the, the numbers from PepsiCo. These are public statements. Um, Nestle, uh, from in two years, reduced about 39,000 tons. Uh, General Mills has reduced um, 30 to 50 percent, up to 30 percent of their products have fewer sugar. PepsiCo, over 10 years, uh, got rid of 435 tons of sugar. Coca-Cola removes uh, in a shorter time period. And Unilever talks about a global sugar reduction in their products of 12% uh, in 2010, since 2010. So now you may say, well, how do I know whether that's real or not? Well, this is USDA data. And what I want to point out here, on the bottom you have the difference between corn sweeteners and refined cane sugar, I don't really care about that. What I want you to look at here is the total. And this is from 1970 to the most recent data from USDA. And remember what's happening here in terms of that obesity question. But indeed, from 1970 to about 1999, sugar intake was going up dramatically. An extra 20 pounds per person per year. This is actually availability, not intake, but it reflects intake. But since the year 1999, which is when companies began their sugar reduction efforts, in fact, sugar availability has come down. It's not quite down to where it was in 1970, but it has come down considerably. And if 
you look at the most recent CDC data, obesity has continued to increase. So just focusing on sugar alone is not going to get us there. Nonetheless, companies are reducing sugar. What, what is, what's in our toolbox? How can we reduce sugar? What's available? And I have to say that there, I have four things there. That's it. There's nothing else in our toolbox. So <laughs> let's talk about each of the things. Smaller portion sizes, absolutely. Probably the best, you know, uh, the best way to address reducing sugar. Serve less. You know, uh, that's pretty easy for people to do. On the other hand, what you do get here is consumer um, hostility. Is <laughs> perhaps a bit harsh, but you're giving me less and you're charging me almost as much. Well, the main costs in the industry are not just about what's inside the container, but the whole shipping and the container itself, et cetera. So there is some pushback on smaller portion sizes. But that, if you make just as uh, the McDonald's burger in 1970 or so was about 250 calories, and now it's about 600 calories, um, that going up, you could just as easily bring it back down. And the same thing is true for things that are sugar. Um, you can make things less sweet. But as Richard Black mentioned in the previous seminar, taste memories are really strong memories. I haven't had a Three Musketeers bar in probably 30 years. I know exactly what it tastes like. And if I had one today and it didn't taste like that, I'd say, what do they do to it? So in terms of reformulating known products, that's very tough. Because the consumer says, ah, this isn't my you know, um, Three Musketeers bar. What happened to it? What'd you do? And then they'll write you and yell and say, I wanted that treat. You know, give it back. <coughs> However, where the opportunity is, is new products. I make Freebus that's, you know, never been tasted before. And absolutely, we can introduce new products that have less um, sugar and are just less sweet, not substituting anything else, and see if there's consumer acceptance. And certainly one area that there's a huge amount of growth is flavored unsweetened carbonated waters. So flavored seltzer. I personally hate flavored seltzer, but I drink plain seltzer all the time. Um, but that is an area for growth. There's no sweetness there. But you could also imagine something that was lightly sweet. As long as you're not doing that to the product that everybody knows exactly what it's supposed to taste like. So that's a, that's a possibility. There's something that we call flavors with modifying properties. Uh, vanilla is a good example of natural ones, but there are now also synthetic ones. They are not sweet themselves, but they enhance the sweetness of something else. This is an area for possible uh, research and you know, continued efforts, but that, I would say, is you know, that only gets you so far. But you can make things taste sweeter by adding one of these flavor with modifying properties so you can use less sugar. And then there's sugar substitutes or low calorie sweeteners. And I'm going to talk a bit more about those and show you some research that we've done on that. Um, because the first question is, is this a reasonable strategy? So are these, uh, can they fit into the diet in a reasonable way? And are they helpful in what you want them to do, which is to lower sugar intake and lower calorie intake. Um, so we, um, and I say we, and <laughs> my main collaborator sitting right there is uh, Dr. John St. Peter. And also we were in collaboration with Bernadette Marriott from uh, Medical University of South Carolina. Um, we wanted to ask the question of, are people who consume low calorie sweeteners, are they eating more calories or fewer? Uh, are they eating more or less sugars? Uh, what, else, what else in their diet are they eating? And uh, do we see the same kind of patterns in normal weight, overweight, and obese people? So we used NHANES. And uh, what we did was uh, looked at three different cycles. Um, we believe that this is represented in the, of the uh, of US population. 
Um, I'm not going to go into a detailed discussion of NHANES. It's considered the gold standard of intake. Uh, but one thing that we did that was unique is that we went in and separately coded for all 8,000 food items, do they or don't they have sweeteners? It was a yes, no. We didn't look at which sweetener, and we didn't look at amount because formulations change all the time. So we didn't have that data. But we could look at the ingredient list for that product and say yes or no. And when we did this, this is what we found. Uh, we divided um, the population into people that did not report using um, any low-calorie sweetener, those that used, um, we call them low uh, consumers, and those that, that we called high. And high meant more than one serving of something a day. Um, and in terms of calorie intake, people who used no low-calorie sweeteners consumed about 150 calories more than people who used some, and even, you know, and people who used a lot consumed fewer calories. And what we really wanted to see, and what we did see, was the total sugar. They're reducing their sugar intake. Uh, people that don't use low-calorie sweeteners have about 133 grams a day. People who um, are using uh, some <laughs> have about 115, and people that are using a lot of low-calorie sweeteners have about 99. And interesting, when we look at other nutrients, carbohydrates are reduced in those using low-calorie sweeteners. Protein's about the same, fat's about the same. But an interesting thing is that dietary fiber is enhanced in those using low-calorie sweeteners. Um, and that data is actually substantiated by some other work that I'll show you in a minute. When we look at this segmented by um, BMI level, we see that it's the same thing for all BMI levels. And here it's just either yes or no. Um, so normal weight people who consume, this is for calories, normal weight people who consume um, low calorie sweeteners eat fewer calories. Same thing is true for overweight, same thing is true for obese. And for nutrients, we see the same pattern. That is, looking at carbohydrates and sugars specifically, it's reduced across all BMI groups. This is data from um, Pierre Nassadal from Betty, Barry Popkins' lab. It's the CHOICE study. And these are people who are on a weight loss diet. So the numbers are going down because they're reducing their intake. But the question is, who reduces it more, the group who were given water or the group who were given diet beverages? So they're eating less dairy, less prepared meals, less grains, et cetera. But this is the one that's important. These are sweets. And the people in the diet beverage group are eating significantly fewer sweets than the people in the water group. And an interesting thing is the people in the water group were eating more fruits. And we don't know for sure, but we think that that might be because they wanted something sweet. And so they were eating fruits to try to um, get rid of that craving for sweet. Now, the question here is, you know, to some extent, why? And it's really a matter of compliance. If in a weight loss program, you say, I've got to have something sweet. Oh, I can have this low-calorie sweetened beverage. Okay, now I don't feel so crazy about having something sweet. So it's not anything magical. Low-calorie sweeteners are not a weight loss drug or anything like that, but they can be used to help um, satisfy that desire for a sweet food. This is data from Adam Drunowski uh, looking at the healthy eating index. And essentially, he substantiates our NHANES finding that those who are consuming low-calorie sweeteners tend to eat more nutritious diets, um, higher fiber, and less sugars. And really, <laughs> that's pretty much all I want to say. I want to, again, thank my collaborator. And um, note that this was funded by the PepsiCo our Research and Development Fellows Program. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right.
There you go. Uh, Dr. Wu-Tan was recently named one of the most innovative women in food and drink by Fortune magazine and recognized by Harvard School of Public Health for her leadership in food policy. She is the Vice President for Nutrition at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, which is named as a top-ranked nonprofit for national childhood and nutrition and health. Dr. Wu-Tan uh, received her BS in nutrition from Cornell and her doctorate in nutrition from Harvard's, Harvard University School of Public Health. Uh, she has coordinated and led efforts to require calorie labeling at fast food restaurants and other chain restaurants, uh, require trans fat labeling on packaged foods, uh, improve school foods overall, reduce junk food marketing aimed at kids, uh, and expanded nutrition and physical activity programs um, at CDC. She co-founded and has led uh, both the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity and the Food Marketing Working, Working Group. Um, she's a powerful voice in shaping the national nutrition debate, and she's quoted regularly in uh, the nation's major media and has appeared in movies uh, such as Super Size Me and Fed Up. So I think we're waiting for slides, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I need to be looking over your shoulder, Kim. I'm just, you know, when you have that feeling of like, oh, I'm not going to have any slides, you know. What do I need to do in order to work that through? So... I'll just leave it here. That's fine. Um, so most people, actually, I'm going to just go back. Most people feel like they are in complete control of what they eat. You know, when you think about your own diet, when you ask people, when you ask parents in focus groups, parents say they're in complete control of everything their kids eat, even though their kids eat at daycare, at grandma's, at parties at aftercare, at school, and many other places, that people just have this idea that food choices are rational, they're conscious, they're made based on information. Um, but it's not like people are actively choosing to be overweight. You know, how many people do you hear saying, like, I would really like to put on 10 pounds before the summer? You know, it's actually just the opposite, that people are actively trying to eat better. In You know, it depends on how you ask the question in polls, but about 85% of people say they, they want to eat better, they're trying to do better, but they just find it really hard to eat well, that they're not able to act on their intentions. And as a result, two-thirds of adults are either overweight or obese. So I'm not here to say that individuals don't play a role, but I'm gonna talk about things other than personal choice just because personal responsibility and personal choice is so overemphasized as the sole way that people are making decisions and we need to think about the other factors that influence people's food choices. So the context in which people make food choices, our food surroundings, our food environment, people describe these with different terms, have a big impact on people's food choices, that um, the ubiquity of food, you know, what food is available to you, you can't eat something if it's not there. The way that food is formulated, oftentimes that's determined by somebody else, and yeah, you have a choice between two different products, but it's not like you can say, I would like a Pepsi, but you know, with just a little less sugar, or can you please give me one of those blueberry muffins, but I'll have mine with half the amount of sugar that you usually put in there. That um, people People, that companies are deciding on those food formulations which affect what people eat. Package and portion size have a big influence. The price, what's on sale, ads and marketing we know are a really powerful driver of what people eat. Placement, where things are on the shelf, um, all affect people's food behaviors. So in the short time that I have this afternoon, I'm going to talk about just a few of those factors and how they influence people's food choices. And I'm going to start with the ubiquity of food. Um, it is both a good thing and a bad thing that we have food everywhere, right? There's almost nowhere you can go in America today where you don't have the opportunity to eat. That, you know, food courts, um, at shopping malls, airports, bus stations, meetings, everywhere we go, we are surrounded with the opportunity to eat. Oftentimes it's a lot of food in big portion sizes and it, um, and it makes a difference. 
most people, when they think about marketing, they think about promotion, they think about advertising. But actually, I would argue that one of the most powerful forms of marketing is that one of those four Ps is place, is just having food nearby, that we are hardwired to eat, and when food is there, it takes effort to not eat it. Right? It, people think about, you know, back in the day where you had to grow your own food, make your own food. It took effort to eat. Now it actually takes effort not to eat. And if somebody puts a plate of warm chocolate chip cookies in front of you, you cannot eat them. And maybe there's one person in this room that doesn't like warm chocolate chip cookies. But um, for most people, they will have to consciously try not to eat those cookies. When you let your guard down, you will eat them. You will just start, they will just speak to you. They will just, um, you will just eat them. So with food everywhere, you know, think about the checkout. There's no store that you can go to these days where you are not assaulted by a wall of food, usually foods of poor nutritional value, most often from the studies that we and others have done, soda and candy and sometimes chips. But it's not just the supermarkets and grocery stores, convenience stores, and the food stores, but you go to buy printer cartridges at Best Buy, or you go to pick up your dry cleaning or the hardware store. You buy a hammer and a candy bar. You go to pick up your prescription at the drug store without the intention of going to buy um, candy. So all of these stores, many, many places and many places in our sur surroundings um, prompt us to eat. And so if you resist, if you are, you know, if you are very diligent and on high alert, people do resist temptation and they resist temptation a lot. But say you resist temptation nine out of 10 times, that one time, you know, can be an extra 250 or with these size candies, an extra seven or 800 calories that you weren't expecting that can tip the scales and lead toward you having a difficult time maintaining your weight. Another thing that affects our food behaviors, and I say food behaviors, not food choices, because oftentimes these are behaviors that we exhibit without actually making an active, conscious, rational choice. Um, another thing that affects our food behaviors are defaults. So defaults are the choices or the behaviors that we, um, we make that, um, that are automatic, that are generally made by somebody else. So think about when you order a burger and it automatically comes with fries and a soda. That's the default. It could have just as easily come with something else, but somebody has decided this for us. There are tons of studies on default, ranging from organ donation to retirement savings to opting in and out of getting on an email list, and they all very consistently show that people are very much affected by defaults, that defaults have a very powerful influence on people's choices. And so oftentimes what people think of as neutral, they think of as that is just the way it is, are choices that somebody has made on your behalf that lead you to a certain behavior. So different kinds of defaults related to foods are when restaurants, supermarkets, or food manufacturers decide on food formulations. So the company decides how much salt, how much sugar, what the package size is, rather than you as an individual deciding, making a recipe from scratch and deciding on all the components. There are food pairing Default. You know, I mentioned burgers coming with fries. It used to be that sandwiches came with pickles, but Frito Lay was very ingenious in their marketing. And many de couple decades ago, they shifted that to chips. So now we just automatically think of chips coming with sandwiches. That was a marketing strategy, not that has become a cultural norm, which leads to people eating more fat and salt and calories than if the default were baby cut carrots that would not add as many calories. Um, portion sizes, 
and packaging is also a default that's often set by others. Many studies show that portion sizes affect how much people eat. And more importantly, or I think more interestingly, they do so in a way that people really don't notice. So in studies where they give people different size plates of food, bags of food, container sizes, cup sizes, people eat more, drink more when they're served more without feeling fuller, without noticing that they've eaten more. And yet, oftentimes in these studies, people eat 20 to 30% more without feeling more satiated. And so the, the default portion size that a company decides for us affects how much we eat. And unfortunately, over time, portion sizes have gotten bigger. And that means that we're eating and drinking more. So back in the day when, you know, in the 1950s, I think we saw some, on somebody else's slide, typical Coke was six and a half ounces. Now you see 20 ounce bottles. I love this ad where 20 ounce or 16 ounce Coke used to be for three. Now a 20 ounce Coke is for one. Um, at restaurants, it's even more so. A large Coke at Burger King is 36 ounces. And so it's not uncommon for people to get about 400 calories from a sit down chain restaurants. Soft drink. So in restaurants, portion sizes are quite large. Oh, we got a little formatting incompatibility here. But, um, but the studies that we and others have done show that a typical sit-down restaurant entree is about 1,000 calories. Add an appetizer or dessert or a soda, you could easily end up with a whole day's worth of calories at a typical restaurant, from a typical restaurant meal, again, without feeling like you've overeaten. That, you know, we see that as normal and we eat those big portions on a regular basis. It matters more these days because eating out has become such a big part of our diet. We are spending about half of our food dollars on foods outside the home, people typically, on average, adults are getting about a third of their calories from eating out. And many studies show a link between eating out and eating more calories and obesity. Big portion sizes, again, um, I think since I don't use a Mac or whatever the thing is, I'm, my slides are a little bit off, but you guys get will get the idea. So big portion sizes are a major form of marketing. I do think that we as Americans do have that bigger is better mentality, but that has been fueled by billions of dollars worth of marketing that reinforces it for food. Companies push big portion sizes through advertising, you know, get more for your money, through displays and sales prompts, through default, through bundling, and through pricing. So for example, you know, why get the gulp size soda at 7-Eleven? You almost feel like an idiot, right? Because for 50 more cents, you could get the double gulp. It's like you're getting, you're ripping yourself off if you don't get the bigger size soda. But not only do you spend 50 more cents, but you also get 400 additional calories by upgrading to the larger portion size. So though companies promote big portion sizes as a bargain, I just want you to think about this with a fresh eye, fresh mind. When you upgrade to a double gulp, you are not saving money. You are actually spending 50 more cents. You are spending more money on extra calories that you probably don't need, many of us can't afford, and that you didn't really want. You didn't go in there necessarily originally wanting that. It's not like you buy the double gulp and put four straws in it and share it with your family. So this idea of big portions where, you know, it does make sense if you buy the big thing of laundry detergent, right, then it's less money per load. But with single serve items at restaurants and many packaged foods, you are not saving money. Though we think of this as a bargain. 
Now, one of the reasons why big portion sizes have been such an aggressive marketing tool used by food companies is because the food in the food doesn't really cost them that much. The final product that you buy, say you buy a candy bar for a dollar, the cost that the company pays to the farmer for the ingredients is only about 14 cents out of that dollar. All the rest of the cost, the processing, the packaging, the transportation, the marketing, the labor, and, and their other business costs say the same. So say in a restaurant you upgrade from a small fry to a medium fry, you pay you know, an extra 50 cents. Almost all that 50 cents is profit. They get you to spend more money, which ke keeping all of their costs mostly the same, right? Still their transportation, their overhead, all of that stays the same. So value marketing has been a very profitable and, um, strategy for food companies that has led to um, this escalation of portion size to ridiculous amounts. I was looking at, um, at a few examples, you know, a slice of cake at TGI Friday's has 1,600 calories. I mean, this thing weighs a couple of pounds. Um, that portion sizes have just gotten bigger and bigger and more extreme as ways to market and for companies to distinguish themselves. So let me just rush through um, one other way that people's intentions can be undermined. This could be a whole hour talk. I have the same feeling as Nicole of like, you know, my usual hour into 15 minutes. Um, but the, but I used to think about supermarkets as a nutritionally neutral space, right? In the supermarket, you can get everything from carrots to candy, but it actually is much more rigged and pushes people in directions to buy certain products over others. If you go into the grocery store and you forget to buy cucumbers, once you get out of the produce section, you will never see another cucumber again. But if I purposefully choose not to go down the chip or the soda aisle, I will be poked and prodded and harangued repeatedly half a dozen times or more to just like, are you sure you don't want to get soda? Are you sure you don't want to get chips? There will be end of aisle displays. There will be a display near the deli. There will be food at the checkout, ensuring that I am reminded again and again. That placement is marketing. And it is, um, and it is so powerful that food manufacturers have shifted their marketing dollars from where they used to spend about a quarter of their money, uh, their food marketing money on trade promotions, you know, in-store marketing, to now where they're spending about 70% of their marketing. So what supermarkets have is basically shelves for sale and food companies pay them to place their products on the shelves, and they pay to get the most shelf space possible. That's the reason, in part, why there's so many different kinds of chips, right? If you have salt and vinegar, barbecue, dill, rippled, unrippled kettle, all these different kinds of chips, and you can take up a lot of space. Then you have a whole freaking aisle of chips. You are not going to miss that. It's not like you're going to, you know, needle in the haystack, miss the chips among the 40,000 items in the supermarket. They also pay to get at eye level, to be on the end of aisle displays, to have freestanding displays. When you see that marketing in the store, you probably think Safeway or Giant paid for that. Mm -mm. The food manufacturer pays to be on the shelf, in the best place, on the end of aisle display, in the checkout, and other places to make sure that you don't miss their products and that you buy more of them. So it, 
runs counter to my nature to just talk about problems without offering some solutions. I'm just not capable of doing it. So I'm going to rush through in just a minute about some of the ways that we can turn this around. So with reformulation, yes, it's terrific to have a range of products available to people, beverages with a whole range of calories. But if companies are aggressively promoting the higher calorie, bigger portion products, not all those products are on the same footing. So those small eight ounce cans of soda, it's terrific that soda companies have them, but those are not the ones that are on sale at the checkout, on the, at the end of aisle display, on sale at restaurants, in the hardware store, in the convenience store, and everywhere else. It is those 20 ounce bottles that you see over and over again. So reformulation is one step, but how those are promoted matters. So I'm going to add a few tools and ideas to Danielle's toolbox. I think there are a few other things they can do. One thing is we can rethink retail. Supermarkets can take control of their shelves back from the food manufacturers, and they can stop promoting foods that undermine people's intentions, that undermine people's desires to eat healthfully, and instead use the marketing, use the placement, the end of aisle displays, the checkout, to support people's ability to eat more healthfully. And we're working with communities on policies, on pilot studies, and with retailers to do this. You can tax soft drinks. Price, very, very powerful form of marketing, has a big effect on what people consume. Studies show, raise the price, people drink more. Look at the soda taxes in Berkeley and in, um, in Mexico, they work. Act. <laughs> um, one of the things that we have done very successfully in cooperation with, working cooperatively with the soft drink and candy and other snack food manufacturers, and that's to get the junk food out of schools. You know, we talk about ubiquity. At the very least, let's protect our kids. And so the Center for Science and the Public Interest work with other coalition partners and with the food and beverage industry. And in 2010, we passed a law called the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which largely gets soda and junk food out of school vending machines, a la carte lines, school stores, and in-school um, fundraisers during the school day. Another hot policy that you might not have heard of is food service guidelines, where states and localities and federal agencies are taking control of what they serve and sell. They're changing what's in their vending machines, what is in their cafeterias, what they serve at meetings, what they're providing through correctional facilities, through public hospitals, and through other institutions, and shifting the mix of products to support healthy eating better. People eat out a lot. There's a lot that can be done in the restaurant setting. One of the places where there's the most movement is in improving the nutritional quality of the restaurant children's meals, you know, starting with kids. And a number of the biggest, we've worked with a number of the biggest restaurants, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, um, Jack in the Box, who have agreed to take soda off the kids' menu. So that is a terrific step that these companies have done to support parents in their ability to feed their kids well. But unfortunately, the majority of restaurants continue to be irresponsible and to push soda on kids. 75% of the largest chain restaurants still push soda on their kids' menus. We love to work with Pepsi and Coke with their um, relationships, exclusive relationships with many restaurants to help these other restaurants to do a better job. Some communities are not waiting for companies to do the right thing, and over a dozen Localities have passed policies to require restaurants to improve the nutritional quality of their menus. Many of these policies set a healthy default for the type of beverages that can be sold with restaurant children's meals. Um, I have Baltimore here in progress. It's very close. The ba Baltimore City just passed a law um, through their city council to improve the beverage options with kids' meals, and we're still waiting for the mayor to sign that, but um, she's expected to do that. So um, I'll just wrap up by saying that it is possible to eat well in America today. 
but it's just damn hard, right? It's like swimming upstream. If you're a good swimmer, if you're well rested, you could swim upstream for a little while, but eventually you're gonna get tired, distracted, your kids are gonna be tugging at your pant leg in the grocery store, and you're going to start to float back downstream. That with three, with two thirds of Americans overweight or obese, this is not just a matter of personal action. This is something that we need to act on as a society. And um, we are working with communities, with states, with food companies to try to help make it a little easier. If you would like to help us, we need your help. This is hard work. And so you can sign up for CSPI's Action Network, write to companies, write to the FDA, write to Congress, to state and local legislators to ask them to do better by families and their kids and to, um, to support healthy eating. You can also look for more information on our website at cspinet.org. And thank you. I look forward to the discussion. So we'll take about 15 minutes now to talk a little bit further on um, your presentations. And um, again, I, I'm not sure that there was a lot of differences in what the two of you said, but I did want to give both of you an opportunity to say a little something. I don't know if you want to add a little bit to your presentation based on what Margot presented and put it in context. Or... Um, no, just that I, I agree that uh, the portion size question is really a problem. And I think that um, it's kind of like trying to turn the Queen Elizabeth. Um, you know, it, it, we, it, there are, there has been progress. You know, the fact that the 7.5 ounce can didn't even exist five years ago, at least it's there. And the one thing I would say is that I do think that consumers have the option, um, that there are many uh, possible calorie amounts and, and possible levels of sugar if we're talking about sugar reduction. So I do think that there are options. And I think that consumers are speaking. The incredible growth in the um, sparkling water category and flavored sparkling water. I mean, it's not my data. It's just huge. So consumers can make that choice, which is not to say that some of the things in terms of shelf space and eye level, you know, I think all of that has been validated. But th the question that that I think is really important is how do we look at the whole diet rather than, I know the topic here is sugar reduction, but I think that you have to realize that sugar intake has been going down. It has not solved the obesity problem. And I think we need to look for a more holistic solution and that that is really important in terms of allocation of resources into air, not that we should not reduce sugar. We absolutely should. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we better look at total intake and also having the environment be more friendly towards movement. <laughs> so I think there's a danger in getting too hung up on we have to do everything, right? So we went to this food system meeting, and I have found my colleagues who have tried to do everything end up doing nothing. Right, that this public health, there's so many problems in the world, there's so much to do. We, you know, if we try to tackle them all at once, we're not going to get anything done. So, so I think it is good to zero in on some of the biggest problems and try to address them, you know, and it's, I'll say one by one, but, you know, I probably have a policy portfolio of a dozen policies that, that I'm working on, but that's, because you know I have a staff of a dozen people, right? So you can't take on too much. And in public health, we do have that tendency of wanting to do too much all at once. And that's not really the way that companies can change or that legislators or other policymakers are willing to change. So I think it does make sense to have fora like this to talk about 
one problem, dig deep, think about what we need to do. That doesn't mean that we're not all working on many other things. We're working on physical activity and saturated fat and trans fat and all these other things, but you, you do have to focus and choosing those things that are the biggest problems in the diet and soft drinks are one of the top sources of calories. No, Shook that's not accurate. Well, no, 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 no. So no, let me finish, no, let me finish my want. sentence. They are the top, they are the largest source of sugar calories, but all of sugar calories are 12%. So that's not fair to say the actual larger is frankly in adults, the intake of alcohol, which is far larger calorie source. And also if you wanna look at individual foods, Pizza is a far greater source in the diet. It is not true that soda is the largest source of calories. So one thing I said, one of the top sources of calories, when you add That's soda, when you add, when you add soda, sweetened USDA teas, data. fruit drinks from USDA's data altogether, instead of dividing them into three different calories, they become the top source of calories. That is not true. So I'll show you my data. She'll show you yours. I'll show you USDA you can decide. data. That's whose data <laughs> I'm using as well. So anyway, we could debate this. It doesn't matter whether it's number one or number two. It is a huge problem. It is the only food that is directly linked to obesity. It is also linked to heart disease and to diabetes, even without being mediated through weight loss. It is a huge problem. It doesn't have to be the only problem in order to be a big problem worth addressing. We could also address chips also a problem, french fries, pizza, and we are addressing other kinds of foods, but it's a big problem and one that needs addressing, and I think it's a distraction when people say, oh yeah, but there are these other things. Yeah, there are other things, world peace, gun control, lots fair. of other things, poverty that are important, but right now, you know, Can some I of us, response? I work on nutrition, I'm gonna focus on nutrition, not world peace. It's not to say that world peace is not I'm more not important. I'm not suggesting that in any way. I am not suggesting that sugar reduction is not important. What I am saying is that if you look, I think first of all, you need to give the food industry and others credit for the fact that sugar intake since the year 2000 has been declining and has been going down. And so that is something that we absolutely, the food industry as a whole has become committed to. Not saying don't, I'm not saying don't reduce sugar in any way. Absolutely an important factor. What I am saying, and not look at world peace or guns in schools or anything like that. What I'm saying is look at what has happened. There has, we're almost back to 1970 levels of sugar intake. We have not seen a concomitant decrease in obesity. If we want to focus on sugar reduction more, we can, but it doesn't seem to be affecting a decline in obesity. So as you know, as a scientist, correlation does not prove causation. But you were just quoting the same studies on cardiovascular disease and everything else that are all association studies. Well, there are some <laughs> clinical studies where you look at intermediate markers as well. Those are association studies. No, well. those are clinical trials. Yeah, I am, well, to date we have, um, to date the, the majority of those kinds of studies are associations, and I agree with you that that's not the best type of data. The question is, do you agree that sugar intake is, is on the decline right now? Yes, I do, and I also agree that there are other problems in the diet, but today we're here to talk about sugar, so let's talk about sugar. I'm absolutely no problem with that. And what I'm, what I'm saying is that from a manufacturing point of view, we have um, certain things that we have been doing. And I think that those efforts have been reflected in a decline in sugar intake. Should those efforts continue? Absolutely. Is there more that can be done? Absolutely. Um, especially, I would say, in the... Um, restaurant area. I agree with you that that area, we in, you know, frankly, in, in um, not just soft drinks, but in um, candy bars, uh, many things that manufacturers directly control, the sizes are going down. So one thing Pepsi could agree to is to work with 
the restaurants that you have exclusive contracts with and ask them to take soda off the kids' menu. I think that's that's, a, I mean, we shouldn't I be pushing no soda on six-year-olds. I actually six think year that's old. a great idea. I have no problem with that. Great. I'm not in marketing. I don't <laughs> represent, you know, I can't get the company, you know, there are lots of things I think would be great. But I, I think that's an excellent idea. I don't think there would be, if you look at what the uh, soda companies have done with schools, you know, there are no more full it's sugar terrific. drinks in schools. They, they, you know, 10 years ago, every school, they don't exist in schools anymore. You know, there, there might be And you, you might all were one. great partners. I mean, we worked very closely with the American Beverage Association, with Coke and Pepsi to pass the Healthy Hunger for Kids Act. And we lobbied together, yeah, not absolutely. Danielle, but her colleagues. <laughs> and it was, it was a terrific partnership between advocates and, and the industry. And, and when we can get together, we do great. And if I ruled the great. world, I would agree that, that, reduce, that eliminating soda you know, from a kid's menu makes perfect sense to me. I can't, you know, but, I, you know, I, this Go is, back and talk I don't to make Indra. policy. <laughs> yeah. And it's well, true that Pepsi and other beverage manufacturers are moving into other product lines. Absolutely. In terms of trying to have... You know, first of all, there exists now mid-calorie beverages that are reduced in sugar by half. PepsiCo and, and, and Coke has similar pledges. First of all, let's talk about the American Beverage Association. There's a pledge right now to reduce calories by 20% in total portfolio by uh, 2025, I believe it is. So there are major efforts in trying to respond to these kinds of things. And Pepsi has definite commitments on sugar reduction and definite commitments on having um, no more than, oh God, it's either 70 or 100, help me, 70, 70 calories in um, the 12 ounce size and that that would become the more standard size, that that would be the maximum. So that's the goal. And the, the goal is to move in that direction. So I think that you know everyone agrees with that. But I think that if we want to talk about health consequences, we also had better look at some other things because this does not, the sugar reduction does not appear to be having the effect that we want. So absolutely, we need to reduce sugar for many reasons. But I think the main reason is that most people do not need excess calories. And I agree. These are calories that are treats. Um, is it okay to have a treat now and again? You know, the Cinnabon or the, you know, <laughs> Frappuccino? Yeah, now and again, I suggest a smaller size. <laughs> well, I mean, there is this escalation of portion sizes. So, you know, instead of a muffin, you know, being 100 calories, it's 400 calories. Cookies have gotten bigger. Pieces of cake have gotten bigger. Soda portion sizes have gotten bigger. You've reintroduced some smaller sizes more recently, but we still have to overcome the $33 billion worth of advertising and marketing that companies spend each year that have a lot, you know, a lot of it's gone to foods of lower nutritional value over the last decades. And a lot of that has gone to bigger portion sizes. And so turning the ship, partly, you know, you guys got us in that direction and we're pushing very hard. And so it, the companies do need to be a, a part of and are being a part well, of I I think trying, that, to, I think that that trying message, to turn around. Not just from activist groups, but also from consumers. Consumers are saying, help us to reduce our sugar. And we are saying, yes, absolutely. Um, through both changing, um, introducing new products that have either no or very little sugar, and introducing and making a maximum to try to um, reformulate or shrink the portion size so that we're not providing more excess calories. So one part of that, though, is going back to what I was talking about, about ubiquity and defaults and um, the promotions, is you still do see the ubiquity of the 20-ounce bottle far exceeds the ubiquity of the eight ounce or seven and a half ounce on the end caps, the price promotions. I mean, these ridiculous promotions where you have like two liter bottles for a dollar, like or 10 one liter bottles for $10, that these things are so um, aggressive in their promotion of bigger portions. So that I, I, I think really it's you know, great honestly, that there's the that. availability of these additional portion sizes and of these mid calorie drinks. But what we need to see is the marketing might the promotion, the placement, the in-store 
trade spend going toward the lower calorie, smaller portion well, items. Just gonna and I think it's in. still not quite. <laughs> It's just one, try and jump one in. second. You the, wanted the us to Super debate. Super Bowl ad <laughs> for this year was for Pepsi Max, which is a zero calorie beverage, and that's something that five years ago you would never have seen. That so the companies are putting their spending dollars, and globally that's certainly happening. So I, I need think to do with the trade spend more, more, better yeah, balance. To be honest. You know, that's outside of my but area that's of the bulk. I mean, seventy percent of the marketing dollars are the trade spend. So it's that in-store marketing is so huge these days that that's where it matters as much. It's good to see the Super Bowl ad, but you need that trade spend to shift. And I know Pepsi's doing some pilots, but they need to do more quicker, better. <laughs> I'm going to jump in in the little bit of time we have left, and just I want I do want to address some of the pigeonhole questions. Although I think you have been in your discussion addressing some of those questions, and um, I think actually Margo, a lot of the questions are coming in for you. On yeah, this. Of course, <laughs> um, and you you somewhat address this in your presentation. But has the food and beverage industry typically cooperated with efforts from nonprofits like CSPI? At first, they usually say no, and then after 10 years of haranguing, they eventually come around <laughs> to yes, I would say. So we have very good working relationships with a number of companies, and with other companies, a terrible relationship. It really depends on what they're doing and, and the corporate culture. So Pepsi, to its credit, is very interested in open dialogue. We, have, we work together where we can, we agree to disagree where we can't, and we really have a very good working relationship with Pepsi, where some other companies, I couldn't even name you know, anyone at the company, they don't return phone calls, they don't wanna talk to us. But I think where we have been able to come together, it, it does make a big difference, and it's good for consumers, and it's easier on the company, and so I think um, the companies that have agreed to take soda off the kids' menu, that's terrific to see, um, but still the majority, you know, have not. Working with the soft drink and snack food companies to get soda and junk food out of schools, I think, was a terrific partnership. Um, the restaurant industry eventually came around to agreeing to menu labeling, and we worked together to get a national provision into the Affordable Care Act. Um, actually, tomorrow is the anniversary of the Affordable Care Act, and so eight years ago, we worked with the restaurant industry to get... Um, a requirement for national menu labeling. So I would say our relationship is really mixed. Sometimes companies react initially very negatively. I remember when we petitioned the FDA for trans fat labeling, most all food companies very aggressively opposed it. The Grocery Manufacturers Association, the Trade Association for a decreasing number of food companies these days, but still for a bunch of food companies. Pepsi needs to quit too. Um, <laughs> but that... You know, they said it was the stupidest idea they ever heard of. They couldn't do it. It wasn't going to make any difference. And so, um, but eventually the industry came around and started bragging about no trans fat in their products. So things will change over time. But I wish it didn't take so long. Yeah, you know, it does take 25 a years for trans fat, 10 years for healthy, hunger free kids. And a lot of that is because of initial industry resistance and opposition. PepsiCo actually started removing trans fat, and I believe it was in like 2004. Right, and I petitioned the FDA in 1994. Well, so you guys about took that. a little while. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just throw in that CSPI isn't the only group working in this space. There are other groups working on public-private partnerships, like the Partnership for a Healthier America. You mentioned the Healthy Weight Cooperative, or Co Coalition. Coalition. I was mixing my acronyms Healthy up Weight there. Commitment. Qu commitment, that yeah. was the word I was looking for. All right, uh, and a question for Dr. Wu-Tan. <laughs> You uh, talked about the irresistible snacking from the wall of candy. Do you think people do not compensate for snack consumption and overall energy intake? There's lots of evidence to show that the number of calories from snacking has increased over time. And so the amount of compensation, you know, there may be some, but people are getting a lot more calories from snacks than they did in the past. All right, well... I think that those are the, the main questions. You guys uh, answered a lot of the questions from Pigeonhole just in your discussion. Thank you so much for your information and for this added discussion. I think it's been very helpful. Thanks for having us.
thank you to everyone and for their time. And thank you to those of you who are actually in the room through the um, end. And for those of you online for attending, I hope that all of you will heavily consider April 26th for the final and third seminar and continue the lively discussion and intellectual debate. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. We can do dueling uh, uh, pie charts yeah. later.